Welcome to McDowell Phillips Home on South Prospect Avenue. This house is one of the most architecturally significant and historically significant homes in the city of Medina. Today we're going to start a series focused on the restoration of this amazing property, learn some of the history, learn about the architecture, and learn about why it's such a special place. It was designed in 1890 by George Nettleton, who was actually a local architect. He went on to become a partner with Albert Kahn in Detroit, Michigan, to become one of the most storied architects of Michigan. Unfortunately, Nettleton passed away in 1900. But this home stands testament to his design and his style of Medina and we're looking forward to documenting the work here and the project undertaken by the Medina County Historical Society. Let's go meet Bre President Brian Farron and learn more about this project. Classical door. Hey, Hi, Brian. Matt. Good morning. Hi, Matt. How are you? Good. Thanks so much for meeting with us today. Oh, thank and you. Talking about the project. Well, it's a very exciting project. I'll be it is. Happy it's, to share with the public what's going on. It's definitely one of the most notable projects being undertaken in the city. So, to kind of set the scene, how how did the historical society get involved? Why are they involved? And what is the vision for this grand place? Well, going back in time, our society is nearly 100 years old. We've uh, been very blessed to have the John Smart House <coughs> Museum for many years, since right. the 80s, and it is filled to capacity. So we've been looking for several years to acquire more space. And as happened last year, 2019, Miriam Phillips approached us, uh, and Joanne King, myself, and said, it's time to sell the big house. And of course, we were very excited. This has been a and dream. everybody knows what the big yeah, house this is. This is a dream house of everybody in town. Sure. Uh, of course, we were taken aback and, and uh, she said just due to the family circumstances the time has come to sell. So we sat down, wrote some notes on paper, discussed yeah. what might be a, a, an acceptable arrangement <laughs> and uh, we wrote a letter of intent to purchase a property provided we could raise the funds sure. to purchase the land and the building and, and of course enough to preserve to fix uh, it. some of the yeah to fix it <laughs> so anyway uh, that started in early 2019 uh, in March we formed a steering committee of some leaders in the community people have gone through capital projects like this mm -hmm. some uh, folks that could help us reach out to the general public and that committee got together they really set the stage okay. to first of all introduce the house to many people in the community that have really never been inside it that was quite exciting yeah and in turn, that helped build our donor base. So we set a capital campaign of $500,000, which people thought was just, Farron had lost his mind. But anyway, uh, we knew it was going to be $300,000 to purchase the house. And by our best estimates, talking to contractors and our own experience, mm -hmm. we felt $200,000 was going to be a good starting point to not only complete some key projects, but help with matching funds for a state grant. Sure, sure. So that's how it got the ball rolling. We had an open house for our donor community, which went extremely well. And uh, we started really getting the ball rolling. Donations started coming in, uh, kind of, you know, got us excited that, okay, yeah. we hit 100,000. Wow, we're really getting there. Well, throughout the summer, things kept progressing well. And through the generosity of several foundations locally, we were able to receive grants from them not just for a single one-shot time, but for over multiple years, right. uh, which really helps us plan and budget the projects. So all that being said, we uh, by the end of uh, November, uh, we were close. We were just over 400000 mm -hmm. and a couple other foundations kind of came through <laughs> at the last minute to give us that little bit of comfort between just giving it all for purchase price. So. We arranged the deal uh, with Miriam Phillips and her daughters and uh, came to an agreement on December 16th. We transferred the property, paid the, the mortgage off in full, and the house was ours. That's pretty extraordinary that in under a year you raised half a million dollars to purchase and preserve this house. Absolutely. And that, that really shows how the community supports the historical society and the work that Absolutely. you've done, but then also how the community feels about this place. Mm -hmm. So. This isn't your first rodeo. You guys have restored the John Smart House, so but this is the big house. What's what's the vision for the McDowell Phillips House, and how is that related to what will continue at the Smart House? 
Many people have asked that same question, and the John Smart House will serve as our primary museum okay. and research center. We have great volumes of property records and uh, family history books and so many archives there uh, for researching right. or just visiting the house. It's a great tour uh, for third graders. Mm -hmm. There's lots of interesting things to see in that house. And there's giants. I mean, who oh, doesn't love the giants? the giants of Seville. Everybody yeah. remembers the giants when they see Captain Bates' shoes and his gown <laughs> and Mrs. Bates and so forth. But this house will provide a much nicer venue, or I should say bigger venue, for events. Okay. You know, we're, we're really limited on seating in the John Smart House to a couple dozen people for any event. Great. This house lends itself to probably 60 or more. And with the addition of two acres of property here, we have the opportunity in the future to even have outdoor events and right. we feel that's going to help uh, generate income to preserve the house. Yeah. Uh, it's also such a testimony to a, a very prominent family that many people weren't aware of till we bought the house. They will say, well, they know who H.G. Blake was, but who are these McDowell guys? Right, right. So we have a lot of education to do on just who they were and why this house was such an important asset to our community. And I think we're going to uh, get there. Um, I might add that one of the attractions of the house, in addition to the size and the location, the contents. Right. Uh, Miriam Phillips and her family graciously left many of the original artifacts here. Uh, the attics are filled with trunks and boxes and furniture uh, from H.G. Blake, his widow, uh, the Phillips family, the McDowell family. We haven't even begun to get through all that yet. Yeah. But the what we have found so far has been a treasure trove of of insight to uh, the Victorian culture as well as the family throughout the uh, the Edwardian period all the way into the Roaring Twenties. So we are very excited about what's to come. It is, I use the word extraordinary in raising the funds and I think that's true. <clears throat> but then also it's extraordinary, this home in itself and the design. It's, it's an amazing example of shingle style architecture. Honestly, probably one of the best in the state. But then as you mentioned the contents, it's extraordinary what has, has stayed in this house from 1890, this was a private residence for the McDowell family. Eventually it was in apartments, mm -hmm. but that stuff was still here. Mm -hmm. And you guys get to go through that layers and layers. And I know when I took a tour earlier and you took me through the attic, it was honestly overwhelming because you think, how did this stuff get here? And, and mm -hmm. what is this stuff? And you want to start going through, but I know that you're very cautiously cataloging and, and preserving mm -hmm. and going through and, and documenting everything up there. Now you, I think you, you recently retired. Correct, in January. Okay, so you retired in January, focused full-time on this. Correct. And, and for you, th this is like a dream come true. This is a dream. I've spent 40 <laughs> years in the corporate environment management roles, but I have to say this is probably the most fun unpaid job you could ever have. <laughs> this is like being seven or waking up on Christmas morning and going under the tree and there's an erector set and Lincoln logs and tink Trinket toys and you get to make this. Mm -hmm. And you get to have fun with everything you're doing here. And it's, it's going to be incredible to watch the progress. Well, we have a great board uh, supporting me too. It, it, it's just not me. It's, sure. it's the entire board. Uh, minus the, the, the coronavirus impact. Right. Uh, we're very supportive in getting started helping us uh, catalog and organize and uh, you know the, it's just so much to do here you're right that Christmas morning surprise is that where do you start <laughs> they're, they're virtually every room holds promise every room holds mystique uh, even the smallest nook in the drawer can produce a wow as, as yeah. you might have heard we discovered the invitation of President Lincoln's inaugural ball in a dresser drawer in the barn. Right. Uh, you know, and again, it's just again, uh, extraordinary. It was extraordinary that A, it survived the test of time, but just an important artifact like that. Uh, it, it's just, uh, we were just so impressed with what might be here yet. Yeah. So we yeah. haven't even got that far to the attic. We've been focused on the grounds, the basement, and the sure. barns first. Why don't we take a walk around the outside? There's been a lot of restoration work taking place on the shingles in particular. Tell us what's going on, kind of what the vision is for the exterior of the home, um, and, and walk us through, point out some of the things that have been done. Okay? Sure. So, shingle style architecture, of which this is an amazing example, is one of the true American styles, very, very popular at the turn of the 19th century. And what's fascinating about this house is at first, it looks very simple. When people think of a Victorian home from the 1890s, they think of something with brackets and columns and all this cool stuff. And they mm -hmm. look at this and they're like, eh, it's kind of plain. 
But I think what's fascinating to me about the shingle style, and, and you've certainly noticed it in working on the house, is when you start to look at the detail and the subtleness. If you look, for example, at the turret here in the corner that just anchors the house, mm -hmm. that's really kind of the focal point, you start to notice the curve of the bay and how the skirting comes out a little bit over that massive granite lintel over the window. And then you notice the little sawtooth cuts. And then you notice the slate around the turret. There is not a flat line or a flat surface on that. And it's very complex you know? construction. <laughs> and you think doing that in 1890 without power tools, this was done by hand or by steam perhaps. And then you start to look at the porch and just the curve of the banister and look at the windows, again, the curve and the small details in what you guys are calling the lighthouse window. Mm -hmm. And then the amazing stained glass window over the landing. And then the, I'm gonna use it again, extraordinary leaded and curved glass of the bedroom window. When you start to put the pieces together, I think people then start to get a feel for how intricate this really is. And to me, this is almost more intricate than a typical Victorian home which is essentially a box with stuff applied on it. Mm -hmm. But here, the design is inherent within the building itself. Brian, let me take a walk around the side and let's really start to look at some of the details. So we were talking a little bit earlier about some of the artifacts and, and the materials that were left in the house. And it's pretty cool that you have the original blueprints. So I, I think you discovered some surprises looking at what was designed, what was built, and then what you bought. Um, for me, one of the fun things that you discovered looking at the blueprints was this arched Pleiadian mm -hmm. window at that top gable at the there. very top. That was gone. I mean, the windows themselves are there, but the arch was all mm -hmm. gone. So looking at the blueprints, you're able to have the carpenters replicate that and then bring that element back. Now, you were telling me a little bit about the turret. Again, it's, it's the curves and the details of that. But tell me a little bit more about that trim and that gutter and what you have planned there. Right. The... Uh Probably the most hidden feature of the turret is actually the gutter system around the base of the, sh of the slate shingles. That gutter actually has a tapered inner gutter that starts high on this end, goes all the way around the, the perimeter of the uh, turret, and then into a downspout. But from down here, or from the front of the house, the gutter looks perfectly level. And that was done to kind of not look like a normal gutter dropping off. And, sure. and uh, So I think it was a real unique way. It, it really challenged the carpenters <laughs> when they had to take it apart and figure out how did they make this thing. Yeah. So they ended up um, kind of reflashing it, resealing it, and be able to reuse the original gutter. That probably saved us over $2,000 of having a custom Easily. gutter made yeah. for that kind of application. But the, uh, we suspect back on the, the arch that during the fire of 1903, when repairs must have hadn't been made to sure. the attic, that the, uh, the, the, the shingles then covered that over. That makes it, sense. It sure. could have been lost during the putting out the fire, we suspect. So it was a really neat find. Yeah. And it is on the blueprint that way. Tom Cavalier, our lead carpenter, did a wonderful job uh, of replicating that keystone and the arches. It's much more complicated than it looks Absolutely. Uh, to do the carpentry and get it uh, waterproof as well. So as they came down the house, what we found is most of the shingles had uh, evidence of dry rot and they were very difficult just to stop at a certain point. Yeah. You start scraping one, the others start coming down. So they ended up actually eliminating all of them except the very top row on this side and replacing with all new and then cutting that very intricate sawtooth around everything. Look, yeah. It has to be cut by hand and that was a, uh, and again, you see the flare out eyebrows over the windows. That takes custom fitting of every single yep. shingle. So again, about eight weeks on the exterior shingling alone to get it right. But, but, but just to, to show the scale, so every shingle that you see that is gray, that's a new shingle that's replaced. So just think of the skin and this, how many square foot is the house? About 6,000 square feet. So about 6,000 square feet, the majority of this exterior has been renovated, restored, or replicated or replaced to get it back to how it looked in 1890. And again, amazing mm -hmm. project that Histor Historical Society is undertaking. Why don't we walk around the back a little bit, Brian, and there's some current work going on. Maybe we can see, see what sure. they're fixing today. Uh, just one other note on the stonework. Our stonemason uh, has been working here for a few weeks to not only match the exact color of the mortar, but to go through and repoint all the stones. And he pointed out it would have taken three or four masons almost a month to lay up this complex of a really? wall and the turret, he said, because you can only do so many feet a day. And actually, over the one basement window, another little detail is the keystone. 
Yeah. You know, somebody had to have the geometric smarts to do that. Cut that and uh, all the weight on that wall is bearing down on that keystone. That's true. So it's very intricate stonework uh, as well. Interestingly enough, one of the first blueprint drafts, that was all siding. So really? somewhere along the line, they made the decision to make it stone. So. I mean, it does anchor Washington. Yes. It had to stand out. It, it did indeed. And that's what Mr. McDowell wanted. Let's walk around back and see what they're doing. So, Brian, another thing that I love about this house is it has the original carriage entrance or port cocher. And there's kind of a cool tie-in to this particular piece of architecture and the historical society that maybe built this relationship. So, what, maybe four or five years ago, you were given an historic carriage that was found literally in the corner of the barn, mm -hmm. almost in pieces. Most mm -hmm. people wouldn't have even known what to do with it. And the Phillips gave you that to the historical society and you had it restored and showed I almost, I don't think they were doing it as a test, but it's almost like, let's give them this and see what happens. I, it could very you know? well be on their minds. I think they were concerned that it has fallen into great disrepair. It's a wicker seat, Surrey, um, more, uh, a small carriage, not a large one, but nevertheless, a very interesting carriage. And when we received it, we said, oh boy, what did we get ourselves into? <laughs> so again, we had our, we went to our membership, had a fundraising campaign to uh, save the carriage, and the, also a mating sleigh that was in the barn, same condition. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had them both restored, one by a professional company in New Hope, and the other by our member, Larry Priebus, who had restored several sleighs. And they both turned out beautiful, and we've had them on public display, and people yeah. just marvel at how beautiful the, uh, not, not only the original paint scheme was, but the uh, restored paint scheme and the upholstery. They're just real timepieces. That Fantastic. I mean, and we truly. have a photo of the actual carriage and horse in front of the house uh, back before this one was even built that was owned by the McDowell family, and it's just an incredible find yeah. uh, in our collection. Again, it's, it's, it's just amazing what is here, the, the history. So on the back of the house, there's some work going on. There's some work to the restoration of, of the back porch or the back deck area. But then there's also another detail that the um, construction crew replicated or repaired, I guess. Tell us a little bit about what took place on this side of the house and that really cool oval window. Well, one of the many features of these houses that by the architect we've discovered is things weren't always symmetrical and, and sometimes unusual placements of certain windows just showed, you know, yeah. and they wouldn't be necessarily on the same side. But in this particular oval window, it was very rotted through. The inside framework actually was charred from the 1903 fire. Oh, wow. So okay. we, got, we were able to access it from the inside and out, remove the entire thing. And uh, Tom Cavalier took it to his shop where he was able to fabricate an entire new framework around it and including the, the white oval trim, mm -hmm. which will be painted, but, uh, and then of course having to secure it for waterproofing and uh, uh, hopefully no penetration going forward. So that detail probably knocks a few days right off there of the sure. carpentry schedule because it was a very important detail and one that we knew we had to do right. And, and so the, he did a remarkable job. Uh, this side of the house in general sees a little bit more water conditions. Uh, some of the gutters had failed, which led to some water problems that we had to address on the siding and uh, that's what contributed a little bit to some of the porch. One post had deteriorated, but 99% uh, of the porch is in good shape. And so we'll be able to rebuild. We're gonna salvage the porch boards, the tongue and groove boards, which are nice. still in fine condition. There's no sense of replacing everything if right. we don't need to. And we really wanna keep the house as authentic as possible. I think what's kinda cool is today with such a strong sunlight is, I would call this a masculine house. It's, it's beautiful, but it's not dainty. But then you get that little, <laughs> little dainty, I don't even know what to call that, little points at the bottom of the shingles that you think 130 years ago that was put there and today that's being replicated just to bring back that little bit of touch that adds some texture to the house. Right, and it's an uh, interesting feature. I've even noticed it on a house right up on Washington Street, similar oh, really? saw cut on uh, Voorhees home, just two doors up. And so it must have been somewhat popular in the Victorian era to have that. Yeah. It might help repel water a little bit off the shingles, I suppose. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a very intricate cut the carpenters had to do one at a time. And uh, it took quite a while, an awful lot of saw blades to cut through that many uh, shingles. And I also love in the project that the historic McDowell Phillips birdhouse is still intact. <laughs> yeah, that has many layers of paint on it, just it like the house. Uh, <laughs> what we did find uh, after the tornado had uh, fractured some of the windows, 
we couldn't figure out why these windows were so heavy when we went to try and replace the weights. The, the inside window weights are twice, there's two of them on each side oh. instead of one. We go, why was That's that? Interesting. Well, until we got the sash out and realized the glass was a quarter inch thick. Um, oh, wow. Okay. There was a piece laying over there, but it's gone now. But uh, very heavy glass. I've never seen glass that thick in a window. Yeah. But that led to the weight and, and why sense. they needed their window weights to kind of help lift them. So those are just a little interesting surprises we found along the way. Sure. Brian, let's continue our tour. Sure. I know on the north side, I'm just can north side of the house, we have some color samples going mm -hmm. on. So I think the next big visual thing is the house is going to get a new paint job. It's going to get a new paint job real soon, and we're real excited about that. Uh, it's going to be a similar color scheme. Uh, we didn't want to alter it very much because uh, I actually have paint samples from the barn of the original red in powder form where they probably mix right on site. And so that was pretty cool to find all that. Yeah. And so it gave us a clear indication, especially when the barrel of paint is addressed to R at McDowell, Medina, Ohio. So we had a pretty good idea that this was the original probably color. Probably red. So the red will probably stay, the dark green will stay. We're just gonna trim the windows out in a little darker green instead of black. And then just highlights of gold. There's four different size corbels on this house, different yeah. sizes and shapes. So we want to highlight some of those little architectural features that normally your eye kind of goes right by. Sounds fantastic. Let's yeah. go take a look. One of the cool things about this house is that since it was built in 1890, it has always been in the McDowell Phillips family. For the initial 50-ish years, it was a single family residence, but then as times changed, the house was transferred or transformed into an apartment building. So part of the restoration of the outside that Brian has been sharing with us is, is a big project, but then also the mechanics of something like this. How do you take a 60,000 square foot house and make it function mechanically today? So one of the things that has been done recently is there were four different meters on the side here. So new power supply has been run to the house and put down to one meter. One of the other things that I love about old properties is trying to read them and see how they've evolved over time. So on the north side, you can see this window is like two thirds boarded up. And you might wonder why, why would they do that? Well, it wasn't like that originally. So this little space, what's behind me is the original kitchen. And then the, where that bay window is, is the original dining room. So this little space is something that was called a butler's pantry. When houses of this era were built, there were separate cabinets inside where we would keep the china or keep the silver. And this mm -hmm. is where the staff or the help could go and get the pieces in kind of an, an interim space. When the house was turned into apartments, this was made into a bathroom, which is why that window was bordered over for a little bit of privacy. It's just another clue to the history of how this has evolved since 1890 and kind of where it's going to go. We're going to walk a little bit further up the house and take a look at some of the work being done on the paint job and get a sneak peek at some of the colors. So for me, the north side of the house is kind of one of the most interesting because of all the stuff going on architecturally. And what's kind of fun is the Historical Society will be repainting the house pretty soon once all the repairs are done. So they're doing some samples of different color options here. Now we know it's going to stay red, we know it's going to stay green, <laughs> and it's going to have some gold, but where all those colors are going we don't quite know yet. Right. The uh committee, uh, we have the community design committee assisting us with their ex experience on the square in color selection and not just the color but also what trim colors and sure. how to trim properly. Yeah. You know, you want to highlight the architectural features but you don't want it to be overwhelming or wrong uh, for the style of the house. Right, right. So what's cool, you're talking about the different brackets. Here under this overhang there's a bigger bracket that has some scrolls on it and then going up the house you know, you can see there's the new red, mm -hmm. which is that deep, rich red that's probably historically appropriate. Some olive and some kind of golds and greens that are really picking out those details. And what's going to be fun is to see this all transformed. And once those colors are put on, to see the columns really stand out. And then to see the columns in the third floor. And that other curved window that we have on the south side is kind of replicated on the north side. I think once the colors are put on and the placement is done, the house is really going to sing and come back to life and then it's gonna be very exciting to see the transformation on the inside. Brian, what do you think the timeline is for the painting and when can people really start to see the transformation taking place? Well, we gave let's the see painters... the second transformation because the yeah. shingles itself. <laughs> yeah, everybody was asking us, is the house gonna be repainted gray? We said, oh no, no, that's just primed shingles. The, by buying them already primed, that saved a lot of labor time in doing so on the site. Plus it also 
protects all six dimensions of the slate shingle, of the, excuse me, of the cedar shingle. So once we get all those final details done, they're finishing up the windows, they're making sure all the windows are operable uh, and caulked properly. The painters will start by scraping and reglazing glass where needed. They hope to get started in the next uh, 10 days. And I'm estimating it would probably take a good two or three weeks, depending on the size of crew, to get this kind of a house yeah. uh, and this size of a house. Two good quality coats, you know, in between making sure all the maintenance work has been done properly. Uh, we'll be on site every day watching. Sure. <laughs> One of the other cool things, I know you're working with a lot of local contractors, and you know Sherwin Williams is is working with you, a local company, Northeast Ohio, contributing to the restoration of the house. So it it really has, in many sense, been a big community project to save this place. It it has indeed, and so many of the uh, people that are very great gracious supporters also recognize almost every contractor we've used here for the uh, the work is a local contractor. We're very pleased to say that. Um, the concrete, the, the carpentry team, the electrician, the HVAC, uh, interior painting, all of our local people. And That's in fact, fantastic. many of these contractors have agreed to even take a slight reduction in their normal rate because they want to contribute back to this wonderful project. So that's all good. In the late 1800s, the Blake and the McDowell families were very prominent families in the city of Medina. They were business leaders, they were elected officials, and they really kind of set the stage for society. What's kind of fascinating about this particular property, we're focused on the restoration of the McDowell Phillips house, but this was not the first house on this property. Again, it was not uncommon in the 1800s and even the 1900s to move a house. So this Greek Revival Italianate house that you see over my right shoulder was H.D. Blake's home that originally sat on this corner of Blake and Prospect. At some point that house was moved so that this house could be constructed for R.M. and Elizabeth McDowell. So behind us is what most people would think of as a typical Victorian house. Now what's kind of interesting is this white house and the green one beside it are twin houses. But these are also part of the story of the McDowell Phillips house. Brian, can you tell us a little bit about how this family kind of moved around this sure. intersection and how we ended up across the street. Well, H.G. Blake, who of course was not only a congressman, but he was also founder and president of Old Phoenix Bank, his two daughters married two McDowell brothers. So as a gift uh, on their weddings, uh, which I believe were just about a year apart, Mr. Blake gave these two houses to his daughters as presents. Okay. And this is where the family resided up to about 1888 or so when plans started happening for the big house. Uh, at that time, Mr. McDowell had risen to the rank of president of Old Phoenix Bank, and uh, he was also quite successful with an insurance agency, sure. and he was on the board of the Farmers Insurance Company in Westfield. So he was uh, quite he was a prominent. prominent man, absolutely. And he uh, felt probably at his stature in the community, <laughs> he needed a, a more substantial presence. <laughs> so hence, we have the McDowell Phillips House, anchoring West Washington, looking up, the story goes, looking up to the bank so he can see who was coming and going. We don't know if that's true, but it's a fun little fact of lore. We do have several photos of sleigh races up and down Washington Street with four or five sleighs, and that's quite interesting. You can't imagine it today, but no. back in its day, that was quite a popular winter sport. So we hope you'll join us to learn more about this historic family and the stories of Medina and the McDowell Phillips family. We'll see you next time.